Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> I have a video from, I had a video from yesterday, but after uh, previewing it, I went, mm, mm, no, no, I don't think I want to put it out there. Um, so what I do want to put out there is just what's going on. Um, yesterday, well, over the weekend, let's just put it this way, over the weekend, um, we... Did a lot of cleaning in the bedroom. Uh, we did some cleaning in other parts of the house. Uh, this morning I took, and I'm gonna take, I, I need to take a picture of it and, and put it on this video before I send it out. But I took a bunch of stuff out of, out of my room, back in my van to take to Goodwill. And um, I'm going to take pictures, I'm gonna take before, I drop off pictures and after I drop off pictures. Um, I don't know if I can do a video without getting um, employees in trouble. So I don't want to do a video. Or if I do a video, I'm going to try to do a video uh, from the neck down. Because, or, you know, make sure I'm just watching, you know. If I do a, if I do a video clip, I'm going to make sure I'm just looking at his hands, not his face. Or his, his, her um, face or uh, ID badge, um, name badge, however you want to call it. Um, I did receive two gifts. One of these gifts was a requested item and one of them was a um, Dave and Sissy deal, I think Jerry said. But the Dave, maybe neither one of them were, I don't remember. So, excuse me, I'm getting like the hiccups. Um, the one item I talked to Jayanne about, but I, I said it's really up to her if she wants me to get it or not, or if she wants to get it for both of us, but it is a miniature Bluetooth speaker, um, with carrying strap. I've already used it once. It, it has superb sound qualities, um... The two buttons here that I thought were volume buttons were skip buttons. So I can skip a song or go back to a song, um, which is great. Then underneath this black little strip is your ports. You have a round uh, 3.5 adapter. You have a charging adapter. Um, well, the top one is the charging. The bottom one is so you can plug this into you're directly into your phone instead of using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And then it also has a little um, mini SD card slot. So if you have like your music on an SD card, you can slip it in there and have it play. Um, ever since I got Bluetooth capability, I don't use SD cards unless they're for, um, you know, holding certain files that I don't want on my computer that just, I don't want, you know, if I have them, I don't want them on my computer permanently because they may be important stuff that I don't want anybody to steal from my computer if they hack it. Um, thank God, thank God they haven't been able to hack my, com nobody's been able to hack my computer. Um, at least not yet. Apple computers are virtually impossible to hack because they use a specific language that is totally and utterly different than IBM. Um, for those of you who use IBM computers, uh, make sure your all your uh, antivirus or or defenses um, are up to date because your computer, as an IBM, is considered a common computer language and easily gotten into. Um, the next item, which was a requested item, because I was thinking I can take it camping, I could take it to work and use it at work if they let me. Um, I could use it around the house because of its design. It is a hand forged chef's knife. And what does it say about the knife? It says high carbon steel forged handmade uh, kitchen chef knife. So this is not exactly something you carry around for self-defense. <clears throat> you could, but you don't have to. It's got a nice leather case. 
snap on safety strap belt loop for carrying it around on your belt. Um, <clears throat> nice wooden handle is designed with a curved handle for ergonomic comfort. Hold for your finger so you can hold it like this. Nice carbon blade, very sharp. I um, literally sliced up a uh, piece of paper and if you notice the cuts on this um, cardboard box, it was from the knife and literally went through the cardboard like butter. So I know this kind of looks like, is it a chef knife or is it a hunting knife? What kind of knife is it? Well, it's a chef knife by design. Now, you could use it camping, you know, you need a nice sharp knife to cut up some meat or whatever, bingo. You can take this with you. You work in a kitchen and they allow you to take this with you, this will be your personal knife. I know a lot of knives in the, my kitchen that I work at are not personal. They're basically knives that were placed and knife holders for common for anybody to use and sometimes their chef knives are not that sharp <clears throat> or they're all being used up or MIA or being hidden um, for that particular person to use whenever they choose to use it which um, is kind of a no-no that's why on the 11th when we go to orientation day this will be with me um, I'm going to leave it in its box. Let's see if I can get it back in its box. And I'm going to take it to work and ask my supervisors if I can use this at work as my personal knife for cutting up meats and whatnot. Because one, I can take it home and sharpen it. Make sure it stays sharpened. And two, I'll know where it is at all times because it will be basically on my hip. Um... Now, it might be, they might say no because of security facts, um, policies of carrying weapons on premises. And if that's the case, I'll ask them, well, can I bring it, use it, hide it in my apron or something like that to carry it back and forth without it being a visible hazard or a visible um, issue. Um... Or I might just leave it home, take pictures of it, and ask around, ask my supervisors. Um, I haven't made that decision yet. Um, but today, um, I already got the Goodwill stuff out of the out of my space into the car, waiting to go. Um, I want to, I'm going to take before and after pictures. I'm going to, basically, I'm going to take a picture of what the room looks like right now. There is still some stuff that needs to be worked on in here, in that, that area the Goodwill stuff was. But because um, one stack of items, which are in containers, um, was a project that me and Jerry were working on. I don't know if we're going to continue that project because it was supposed to be a cosplay outfit but that was when i was digging or being really um into assassin's creed uh Ezio or um connor um i'm more now into um between the game itself and my my um norse studies i'm like hmm how can i make an a uh, an Avor outfit without, you know, blowing the bank. But then I'm like, I don't need to, I, I, it's not that I don't need a costume. Um, it's probably going to get worn only once a year. So that's a waste of time, money, and effort. Um, I'm trying to downsize stuff instead of up, upgrade stuff. Um, I've got enough Nordic clothing in my closet to do a base generic everyday Nordic person 
without having to go into cosplay. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of things that I'm looking at nowadays as in, do I need to do that? Do I need to go that way? Do, is it necessary? Um, but after something that happened yesterday, which I'm not going to talk about because that's kind of between me, that particular individual and the universe around us. Um, but because of what trans transpired, um, I am rethinking a lot of my, a lot of myself, um, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. Um, I know a lot of things that I may end up reading or talking to you guys about is kind of like, I don't know if I'll even talk about it. I might, I might not. I don't know because it's, it's a change that's, that's been eating away at me of you need to do this. You need to make these changes. You need to do certain things that are outside of my comfort, my normality, maybe even my spiritual self. Um, no matter what these changes are though, I know this much because I know every time I go to make a change to my spirituality, I am constantly reminded by the universe that you have to, that I need to, um, one, be careful of what rabbit hole I jump down. Um, two, make sure that I'm always in the light. Um, and three, find ways to incorporate what I'm learning in areas that I need to incorporate into to be the person I'm meant to be. And, uh, well, I know because of it, I may or may not lose people because it it might be an area that some people are uncomfortable with. And the thing is, and I will tell you, tell you truly, one, it's already scaring me because it's out of my norm. It's out of my my out of the box, basically. It's out of my out of the box that I'm usually stuck in. I need to get out of the box. Um, I need to explore. I need to expand who I am. Um, know better who I'm supposed to be. And. It's kind of a, a touchy uh, um, situation. Because of. Um, how do I put it? It's trying to take old school and mixing it with no, new school. Because I think sometimes um, old school is just as potent or as important to our daily lives as new school. Um, I know it's gonna, I know some things I'm gonna say might raise a lot of questions, might raise a lot of eyebrows. Um, and no, I'm not looking to stir up a pot or a negative realm. I'm trying to be, like I said, I'm trying to stay in the light. I'm trying to stay as pos positive as possible, but it's one of those things where, like Jerry said to me this morning, it is good to research your past. It is good to research and understand your ancestors, but does not mean I have to be them. I could be a new me without living in the past. I could be a different version of me that is stronger, more positive, more energized, more aware of what's going on and being able to do everything that needs to be done without negativity. Now, 
I read something recently that was kind of like an eye opener, yet I understood it, understood it quite well. And the saying was basically, just because you have neg negative thoughts, don't mean you have to act upon them. We can be as positive as possible and have, have a negative thought, but it's how we take that thought and how we deal with that thought determines the positivity or negativity of one's life. So let's say, well, no, let's not say, let's just jump back to my past. I know a lot of times I try to leave my past in the past because it is the past, but sometimes the past are stepping stones into the future. So let's go back to my younger, younger years when a lot of negative stuff happened. And that negative stuff is basically death, death, multiple, di multiple people dying within my family. I didn't know which way was up, which way was down. I had a lot of negative thoughts and I started to act upon those thoughts. And one of those thoughts, which is extremely negative and extremely bad for the soul. Thoughts and near actions. Actually, I did I did go and act of suicide. Because I, I just couldn't handle it no more. And I thought the best thing for me would be to be removing myself from the world. Removing myself from the picture. And I did try three times to overdose. And I had in my cabinet for overdosing everything from a super large bottle of Advil, antidepressants, antipsychotics, antihistamines, um, allergy pills, uh, a lot of prescribed medication. First time, not successful. No. And after that first attempt, I ended up spending 30 days in a behavioral health center, Camelback Hospital, Phoenix, Arizona, for those who want to look it up. I thought everything was a-okay. -okay. I thought I got a lot of good help. Got back in the real world, got outside the hospital, went right back down that rabbit hole. Too much stress. Too many things getting on top of me. Too many things irritating me. No help. No, no outside help. Mom didn't know how to help me. My family didn't know how to help me. Um, it's those kind of things that are like old school. Oh, we don't talk about that. We shelf it. We put it on a shelf and leave it alone. You can't do that. You get too many negative emotions or emotions of one form or another, negative or positive. You shake that bottle just right and... <laughs> It blows up. Attempt number two. Ended up back in the hospital. Another 30 days in the behavioral health hospital. They were feeding me these antidepressants. And by the time I was going to leave after the 30th day, they told me they had to take me off the antidepressants because the toxins in my blood were built up to the point of lethality. Could have killed me if they increased the dosage one more time. That right there proved how strong my immune system was and made me go, aha, the reason why I'm not dying is I'm not taking enough. Yeah, I was ready to die. I told the, I told the doctor, and so just increase it. If I die, I die, oh well. I'll even sign a waiver to make sure it's not on your hands. They couldn't do it. Fine and dandy. Okay. Third and final attempt of suicide with medications, with pills. I was not living at home anymore. I was living at a place called LDI, Life Development Institute. It was a little community of sorts. or a, Somebody had taken a old apartment complex and turned it into this learning center, learning how to deal with the real world and get a job and maintain, you know, things that still didn't click. Well, it didn't click back then. It clicked, it clicked after I got married. Um, let's just put it this way. Nobody ran me to the emergency room or whatnot because 
two or three people who were really concerned with my well-being, good, close friends, um, realized what was happening and literally made me, um, cough up or puke up the, uh, the, the pills. Um, but by the time that happened, I had, it wasn't that I was like, so, so far gone that I was considered dead, but I had what a lot of people in the new age realm called a near death experience. An experience that sometimes you you can explain, but you don't understand it, and it's in and even and other people do. Um, think you're nuts because they couldn't because they can't understand it. And near death experiences are barely being proved by the medical community. Um, let's just say I came out of the trance like state, however you want to put it, with the knowledge. That knowledge is one, it's not my time. And two, I am protected from what could be the, the, the darkest, darkest part of life. Literally protected from the devil himself. Um, and that's when I realized that um, no matter what I try to do to extinguish my life, it's not going to work until they're ready for it. Um, so I realized that I have to live life with a purpose. The problem is I had, didn't know what my purpose was back then. Now I do. Now I do. She's in the other room right now with her home health aid. Um, that's my purpose. She is my purpose. Um, but I have also been told lately or recently that I have other purposes besides Jerry Ann. Um, not going to really talk about that in depth, but let's just say my dreams are supposed to be messages from above. Whether you believe it or not, that's, that's up to you. But let's just say this much. I've had vivid dreams in the past and did not record them. This time around, I realized I need to record them and record several, several days worth of dreams to interpret their message, meaning, whatever. And I was kind of like, okay. Of course, I was told people who must think I'm nuts, but that's fine by me because I already know I'm nuts in one way, or shape, or form. And just add to the, you know, the, the list of things that make people think I'm nuts. You know, what do you do? But moving forward with, with this newfound knowledge, plus knowledge, you know, information from my past. Um, I realized that I have a platform here. Now, I'm not going to try to use this platform to convert people or, or anything like that. But I have this platform that I could use for the benefit of not just myself, but maybe somebody out there who's listening to me hears me talk about a dream that I might have, might have had, or what I remember from my dreams, and can have can can gain a little bit of knowledge, self confidence, whatever. Because the funny thing about dreams, and I know this from my past, is you can have a dream and you might not see faces. You might not know names. But unless the, the, the name or the, per, the, the person's face is needed for part of the dream to deliver whatever message. But most of my dreams that I've had in the past, you don't see your the surrounding of the dream is usually blurred out. It's the, 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 the important focus of the dream that you can see vividly. Like for instance, last night or this morning, however you want to put it, I had this strange but vivid dream, point of view dream, basically. It was like I was the 
person in the dream, but I don't know because I didn't see anything that I could recognize as me. But what it was, was point of view of a, of a hand and an arm reaching out and it was reaching out towards a bee that was stuck or clinging to the, the, the frame of an air conditioner, like a window air conditioner that has those frames that keep from falling out, the metal frames. And the, the finger of this hand reached out and gently removed the bee from the frame. The bee didn't sting, the bee didn't do anything, didn't try to fly, fly away or anything like that. And in the dream, after removing the bee from the metal framing, um, put it on a flower. And that's all I remember. I don't have any flowers around my house. I don't have window air conditioners outside of my house. Um, so it's kind of like, okay, who was doing the action? What mannerism or energy or whatnot was being, the person was producing that kept the bee from being aggravated and seeing the person? Um, where could this be located? Um, the, the flower looked like your ordinary daisy. So maybe that's important. I don't know. But a lot of times if there's a vivid dream and I, I want to try to figure out what the vivid dream is, which I never did in the past because it's like, okay, it's just a crazy dream. No, Jim, you're not crazy. You're getting, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for the dreams. I know scientifically a lot of scientists, a lot of people study sleep and dreams that are within the medical, not the new age healer type person, but a doctor or somebody, a um, psychiatrist, let's say. Um, they'll say, oh, it's because of, you know, something that happened. You know, it's just a reflection of something that happened. No, because if it was a reflection of something that happened or could happen, or your your subconscious wants you to to know about it would be less i mean with what's been going on lately it would be less about nature and a bee and that kind of thing it would be more along the lines of something to do with jerry ann's cancer or you know my desires for camping or rving um my answers for a better income. Dreams of that state. This is a dream out of the box. This is a dream that I would never have. Uh, you know, if if medical science is correct, that dream would not have happened because of the things that are going on around me. It doesn't reflect in the dream. So it's like, okay, if I'm the one, if I'm the one that was dream was doing the the helping the bee out. What does it mean? You know, how do I interpret it? Now, I'm not sure. I just know it was, it was a dream about somebody helping a bee from an, I don't know, maybe something about the uh, metal framing on the air conditioner unit was, you know, endangering the bee. Um, Maybe it was, an, it could have been, you know, it could have been a queen waiting for a swarm of other bees to create a colony on this framing and could have been in a endangerment to both the colony and the owner of the air conditioner. I can come up with a million different possibilities, but what is the true meaning? Was it something I need to do? Was it something somebody else needed to do? I don't have, like I said, I don't have metal, metal framing for air conditioning outside of a window. I have a standalone unit that's pretty much open air and got a lot of open vents for bringing air into the unit to help cool off the house. But nothing like what I saw in my dream. Don't know. There's a lot of things that 
happen in dreams that are very difficult to um, interpret. That's why you can't do just one dream at a time. You have to take a whole, whole week's worth of dreams, maybe, and try to compile it and then piece it together. And then you go, aha! Don't know. But the new path that I'm starting to go on to or, or feel that I need to be on um, it's a positive path and it's not totally a Christian path yet it's not totally a new age or pagan path it's just a path within a light and to a lot of people who who are new ageists or Wiccan or pagan or whatever the light represents positivity positive energy from the universe well, God created the universe, so I'm going to say it came from God. It's it's God's light. Even if it doesn't sound like I'm talking about God. Um, you know, the Christian God. I don't... In the last... I'm going to say 15, maybe close to 20 years... I don't really include everything about myself within the realm of Christianity, but I also don't include my whole self into um, the New Age, Wicca, Pagan, whatever you want to call it. Um, I believe that it's a universal energy. It's a universe created by God himself. And it, you can say God, you can say Buddha, Mahama, you know, Odin, Zeus, whatever, you know, deity you want to call them. I think it's all universal. I think it's all one and the same. Now, you might disagree with me because of the fact that we think, okay, God is, 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 you know, God the Father, the Christian God, is the creator of all things. But every culture, every old school religion before Christianity came into play um we had you know every culture had a different group of deities whether it was the Norsemen with Odin and Thor and Loki and Heimdall and Freya and Frigga and Tyr and you know, I can keep going on and on and on because I know more about them than I do the old Greek and Grecian gods or the old Roman gods or the old Egyptian gods they had a head figure with his creation story or his his story of how he became the the head deity with all the other deities that were either sons or daughters or whatever um and then you've got like I'm probably going to mix this up, but you've got like Zeus and Aphrodite and uh, Hercules and even though Hercules was a demigod, um, Hades and, and Poseidon and all those gods. Then then you have the Egyptian with Ra and all those gods. Um, I'm pretty sure the, you know, like in Japan, the, the old school Japan culture. I don't know what they call their 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 god, but most of the other entities that they either paid homage to or whatever were spirits or I don't know if they called them gods or not, but they you know Chinese had the same thing. I'm per I'm yeah, I am one hundred percent sure the Africans of great, the different tribes of Africa had their deities. Same thing with over here in the the Americas we had um, the Mayas, the Incas, the Aztec, the Toltec, uh, they had their different deities. Even throughout the 500 tribes of North America, they had their great spirit. That was the head spirit. And then you had all the other spirits and, you know, and, you know, the great spirit was basically their high deity. But they didn't say God, they said spirit. So I think the difference is how you perceive or go about looking at the different cultures and the different religions before Christianity. 
And I know a lot of people go, well, when Christianity came around, all that was wiped out. No, it wasn't. It was just pushed aside. Just like here in America, the white man came and pushed aside the, the natives. Same thing with Christianity. The old religions didn't die. They just got pushed aside and, and, and were hidden from the rest of the world. Because they didn't want the persecution that Christians placed upon them for their pagan rituals and beliefs. It doesn't mean it died. It just means it went dormant. But what I have noticed, and a lot of people want to deny this, but I have noticed this in America, especially, I don't know about other parts of the world, but in America, there is such a new spiritual uprising that a lot of the old ways, like paganism and shamanism and druidism and all that, are on the rise. Because more and more people are getting tired or getting shunned or something about the Christian church is causing them to look into the old ways. Now, I don't have it, but there is a book out there that I know about. I just haven't gotten around to look for it, but there is a new book. There's a new, there's a book on there on the new religions or the new paganism. And unlike old school paganism where we used animal sacrifices or whatnot to do certain rituals or pay homage to certain gods, they are using a substitute. They're not using blood. They're using wine, mostly mead, um, or certain kinds of home brews that people know how to brew up for the different rituals or the different um, whatever. Now, we've talked about mead when I read the Viking um, handbook. Mead back in the old days, because honey was hard to find or, or produce because of the short um, growing seasons in the upper parts of, of the world. A lot of the old Nordic, or the, the, yeah, the Nordic nations are very close, if not within the Arctic Circle. So it's very, it was very difficult back then to produce enough honey to make large quantities of mead. So mead was a special drink. It was a, a special social drink or celebratory drink, celebrations. Um, nowadays, because honey could be mass produced in honeycombs or in various different methods or shipping, you know, America makes mass quantities of honey because of our growing season or either and certain parts of Europe make mass quantities of honey because of their growing season. It is now easier to make mead on a regular basis. Um, so mead is, is, is still considered the drink of the gods. Um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of modern day pagans would use mead or homebrewed mead or chunks of honeycomb as a sacrificial offering instead of blood. But the thing is, is my journey is my journey. I will go in whatever direction I feel pulled towards. And right now I am feeling pulled towards getting more understanding and getting things done and it's time, I mean, yeah, it's the bottom of the hour, if you want to go by football terms. Um, it is close to end of end game. And what I mean by that is it's close, it's, summer is coming to a close. And I'm going to be going back to work sometime after the 11th, I hope. Sounds like I will be, but, you know, never can tell until it happens. You know, never can tell what's going to happen until the, foot, the ball drops. Um, shoe falls off, whatever you want to call it. But one of the things I have learned over the last couple of months is I can't try to fight the wave no more. I have to learn how to ride the wave. Let it take me where it's going to take me. Yes, there will be turbulent waters. Yes, there will be calm waters. It's all part of life. You have to take the good with the bad. And the thing is, we can take the bad and 
shelf it, put it off to the side, not let it affect us. Because I am pretty sure the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, um, he's the one who's in control. He's the one who decides. Okay. We're not supposed to be negative people. If you're walking in the light and you're truly walking in the light, there's no gray. And, well, there is a gray, but it's a danger. It, gray can be a danger zone. We have to make decisions for ourselves as individual people to either walk in the light or not. Now, I've been in the dark. I've been in the gray. I'm not usually one who goes between light and dark. I'm either, it's all this or it's all this. I don't play around in the gray that much because usually when I play around in the gray area, I just become content. I don't worry about cleaning up. I don't worry about doing things that are important. I just sit back and relax and watch the world go by. We're not supposed to do that. We're not meant to just sit back and watch the world go by. We are an intricate part of the universe. No matter what we believe, we are an intricate part of everything around us. And that doesn't just mean your circle of friends, or your garden, or your backyard, or your home, but everything. We are a part of each other. We are a part of the world around us. We are a part of the earth. And we are a part of every aspect of life. Not just our little universe, not our little bubble, not our little square, box, whatever you want to call it. We are part of something so big that the reason why we cannot fully understand it, let alone barely grasp it, is because it is too big and too wide and full of too much information or too many things that we cannot even get a speck of the infinite knowledge and power that's out there. Oh yeah, we've had many men and women who've gotten a divine spark of knowledge to create some great things or just create things that could be used for the betterment of mankind, but instead, some of it's been used to basically destroy, destroy each other. I am pretty sure when Albert Einstein discovered E equals MC squared, even though he could not handle 2 plus 2, let alone 2 times 2. I don't think he des designed it or discovered it for the purpose of mass destruction weapons. Or nuclear capability. I think he discovered it as a way to create energy. For the betterment of mankind. Not the destruction of mankind. I don't think um, Louis, La uh, Louis Pasteur discovered how to create vaccines against diseases. Granted they were during his time. Look at one of the look at the father of modern day invention, Leonardo da Vinci. The man had great ideas. Granted, a lot of the ideas that were accepted were weaponry, tanks, helicopters, flying devices. He had the idea for those things. I don't think his ideas, those are some of his engineering ideas, but he has so many engineering ideas and science ideas and medical ideas that were shunned by the people of the time. In fact, he probably hid most of it because he would be considered a hypocrite and an enemy of the church and state and put to death. They accepted his blueprints and whatnot for tanks. One of them called the turtle, which was actually used, made and used. We have some great minds out there throughout history. Problem is, people in charge took those ideas from these great minds 
to create death and destruction. Not peace and harmony. No, I'm not saying that Leonardo da Vinci was was arrogant by creating his blueprints for these items that we now use today for the military, let alone transportation across the ocean within hours instead of days. But the thing is, this is how the this is how things work. We have choices, and yes, we all have ma made bad choices. I can handle, hold up both hands, because I've made a lot of bad choices. The reason why we make bad choices is because they're on the moment, on the spur of the moment decisions, instead of sitting back and going, hmm, should I go this way or should I go that way? That way's got a lot of brambles and bushes and thorns and hills and valleys. And I don't know if I want to go through all that. This way looks like a straight and narrow path. I'm going to take the straight and narrow. Oops. Straight and narrow, you can't see beyond a certain point because the factor, it looks like it goes on forever. You don't see the hill, the twist, the turn, the brambles. You don't see how bad it's going to go until you get there. But if you see something that looks like right off the bat, it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be full of trip falls and thorns and sticky bushes and just all kinds of things that's going to hurt you in the beginning. And we don't see the light or the calm garden or the babbling brook or the shoreline of an ocean. What we see is the hardship that's going to hit us immediately. And we go, no, I don't want to go that way because I have to go through all that hardship without knowing what's on the other side of it. All we see is that hardship. But then we look over here and go, oh, wow. It looks like a clear, smooth path. But you still run into trip falls and problems and issues that you didn't think you were going to run into. But the thing is, when you hit that stuff after going through the good stuff, it makes you just want to sit down and give up. I don't think God wanted us to give up. I think God wants us to see the rough patch before the light, before the Garden of Eden, before your what He desires for you, which is all good stuff. I know. You know why? I had to deal with that here in this own here. When we found out about Jerry Ann's cancer, I didn't want to go through the rough patch. I didn't want to deal with that that beginning roughness. So I chose the smooth path by just sitting back and going, I don't know what I'm doing, let the doctors deal with it. Then I got to a point where it's like, oh my god. I gotta do this and this and, da -da 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 and get frustrated and aggravated and just wanted to give up. But I don't think it's gonna be a very long rough patch. She's doing better. Her cancer cells are shrinking. Her bone is re, re, re I don't know how you call it, hardening. Uh, cal recalcifying, that's the word I was looking for, recalcifying. Her spirit, you know, she's doing good. Yes, today she is re she's revisiting and going and doing the chemo, the 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 um, cabaminix pill for the chemo. Um, the doctors and her agreed that one chemo pill every other day to see how her body reacts to it before increasing a dosage or changing the dosage. Um, and then once they figure out how the body is reacting to the cabaminics, then they're going to talk about the immu immunotherapy. I'm all on board this time. This time I'm like, okay, I know what to expect. We've been through this before. Let's hope it's not as bad, but I'm ready for it. That's what I need to do. 
I need, I need the system to go, okay, yeah, we're going to go through this rough patch again, but I know once we get through the rough patch, things will get better. It's, you know, that's how we have to approach it. Because if we don't approach it with that sense of, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I can make it through. And once you make it through, if it happens again, you know what to expect. You know she's going to be tired. She's going to be sore. She's going to be cranky. She's going to be just lethargic. She wants to, she's going to not want to eat. Or her weight's going to drop again. She's going to want to have soft foods like soup or really, really chopped up chicken salad or, or something creamy and soft, but it still gets her the nutrition, nutrition she needs, you know, more shakes. I have to learn how to make shakes with berries. I have to learn how to do certain kinds of shakes. So she gets the fruits and vegetables that she needs and the protein from protein powder. You know, I know what to expect. I know what I need to do. And this time I can do it instead of sitting there going, um, 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 what can I do for you? I don't know what to do. No, no. Yeah, there might be days where I go, okay, she's a little worse than I, I was prepared prepared for, but I have to be gentle, I have to be calm, I have to just try to do what I can. I have to communicate with her to say, I don't know what I can do for you, but if you let me know, I'll try my best to get it done, to do it. You know, that's what I'm gonna end up having to do. Now I know when I return to work, the home health care, home health person, we rearrange the schedule where she'll come in 11 to 2. So from the time I leave at 530 to the time the home health person comes in, Jerry will most likely be asleep after she eats her breakfast. And her breakfast will be either oatmeal, eggs, or I've got gluten-free pancakes that she made a bunch of. They're in individual bags, so I can just pull out pancakes, throw them on a plate with some sausage. Maybe not sausage, but put them on a plate, heat them up, take in, like, the food, the syrup, maybe, um, if I can get things working right, a little bowl of fruit, um, or a sliced up chunk, you know, sliced up banana, so she has that fruit or vegetable with each meal. Um, I'm semi-prepared. I can't say I'm fully prepared because I don't know how bad it's gonna be this time around. But at least I have an idea of what she can tolerate or what she's gonna need. You know, this is the thing, this is one of the things or one of my gifts that I was given now is to be sensitive, to be a caretaker. To literally wear my heart on a sleeve so I can help people out. Um, that's why I get a little cranky when people want to get really negative. You know? And I, I really don't care what people say about Jerry. I really don't. I know who she is. I know she has the same thing I have. We like to be in control of situations. But the difference between me and Jerry is I'll be the one to step aside and go, okay, you've got this, go, go for it. But my biggest thing is we get into a headbutting from time to time because she tells me she wants me to do a certain thing and my brain goes, okay, she wants me to do this, I can do it. Boom, 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 I got it. I, I got it set up in my brain how I can do it and, and be proficient at it and not get like worn out or whatever but then she'll have her vision of the way she wants me to do it and i'll be like whoa i understand the way you want it done but if the end results are the same thing of what we want or what we you need then let me do it my way please because i have a hard time doing it other people's ways if they cannot explain it to me in such plain flat out explanation layman explanation i'll be i'll get myself confused because i'll be like wait a minute i can do that but if i do it my way it's gonna be more comfortable it's gonna be it's gonna feel like i'm doing it not being controlled or told how to do it um there are just certain things that we still are working on because like look 
I love you to death. But if you're going to have me do it, I need to do it my way and hope it comes out the way you want it to come out. Otherwise, I have a hard time, not because of the fact that I want to fight authority, but I have a hard time doing it somebody else's way because I can't get it to, I can't get it pictured in my brain on how it will work or how to do the steps. But, um, Oh my goodness. Oh, um, yep. I am so sorry, folks. This, this is almost an hour long video. Uh, let me end it there. Um, I hope you enjoyed or could understand or keep up with me. Um, if you like this video or could keep, you know, basically, if you feel positive about this video, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, please put your questions in the comments in there. I will do what I feel necessary to do with these comments, whether I ignore them because they're too negative or I might ask, I might answer them and then add a question because maybe I don't understand what you're trying to get. You know, if I don't understand what you're trying to ask or say, I will ask you to explain. Um, but yes, I will deal with the, deal with the questions and comments to my discretion. Um, most of most of my most of my viewers who have been with me for a long time understand my ticks, whatever you want to call it. Um, so their questions or comments are usually um, very specific. Uh, if you're not new to my channel and want to join, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Um, but before you join, let me just tell you this much. My videos will contain anything from spirituality to possible Bible stuff to historical information about the Norsemen to whatever I'm reading at the time or studying at the time. Right now we're going through this particular book um, or as it says on the side because I like the way... Oh, the back. The back is better when I show it to you. Who were the Norse or the Vikings? Um, the term Viking is a occupation, not a people. So, in, in essence, we're not really talking about Vikings. We're talking about the Norse people and and their um, occupation of being a Viking. So, this is not about b being brutal or savage or going out raiding. This is everything and anything that has to do with the culture, their living style, their clothing, their tools about the Norsemen. This should not have been written as the Vikings handbook. This should have been written as the Norse handbook because it talks about everything to do with the Nordic people, not just their occupation as Vikings because Vikings were just one group of Nordic people, but there was farmers and fishermen and tradesmen and craftsmen. Um, so it talks about all that stuff. Um, so if I'm reading this book and you see me like grimace when I say the word Viking, when I should be saying the word Norseman, that's because of the fact that the, the author of this book wrote it, making people think it was about their, the Vikings and how hardy they were and how much they went out raiding and, you know, all that bloody gory stuff. No, this is about the people who were called Vikings, the Norsemen. Vikings is an occupation. Norsemen is the person or persons or nation. So, yeah, you'll hear me do a lot of correcting or, or making grimace faces because they're using the wrong words um, in my mind. Now, if I wanted to, and I don't know when this book was originally written, so I'm sorry that I'm taking a, long, a little bit longer to... Um, exit but I would love to um, get a hold of the author in fact the author's name sounds like a Norseman but it even says on the front cover the Viking handbook eat dress and fight like a warrior but the thing is 
it should have more on there or it should just say the Norse handbook. But anyhow, that's what I'm studying right now. I'm trying to get through it, but every so often my brain goes, hey, you've got other things that you want to put out there. So, I, yeah. Anyhow, oh my gosh, Jim, I am so, so sorry. Let me just get off here before it gets longer. If you want to subscribe because of the things I'm studying or dealing with, that's your choice. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Once you do that, there will be a little bell that pops up. You click on that bell and YouTube will let you know when I put out my next video. And again, I apologize for this being so long. You guys have a good day. Bye.